And today, as you guys know, is Pentecost. Pentecost the day that we celebrate the early church being empowered by God himself to win the world for Jesus Christ. And think about this. Think, think about what they faced. What? Well, the people going into the Roman Empire and they hold to their faith an entire world without Jesus. And nevertheless, today, today in our world, there are over 2.1 Christians. Christians throughout the world who know this because it all started 2,000 years ago on Pentecost with the early believers being empowered by the filling of the Holy Spirit to win the world for Jesus. That's the only reason that there's any power in any message that I preach is because there is doing something. If it were just me, zero people would get saved. It is only the filling of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit that does anything. But that's the gift that we have as Christians, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and to be able to speak the very words of God. That is an incredible honor. So, you know, I, I was getting things together, and I'm like, what should, should I say about Pentecost? And I'm kind of on this kick right now where I'm like, why don't I just let the Bible speak for itself? Why do I need to come up with all this fancy stuff? So literally what I have here is Acts chapter 2. And it says this, When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. So they're all gathered together. Suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. This is interesting, because last week we talked about Elijah at Mount Horeb, and if you recall, all these things happened, and then in the still uh, breeze, he heard the voice of God, right? But here on the day of Pentecost, it is wind again. Interesting. So it was wind when God spoke to Elijah. Now it's like this violent rushing wind that, that it says came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were staying. You know, it's not like one side of the house was missing and all this wind is blowing in. No, it was God was causing this violent rushing wind. And it says they saw tongues, tongues in the air that looked like fire, tongues of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. So maybe one big tongue and then 11 little ones shot out to the believers over each of them. Very interesting. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different languages as the Spirit enabled them to. Interesting, right? So they're able to speak in all these different languages. And remember, there is a feast going on in Jerusalem at this moment. So there are Jews who have gathered in Jerusalem from all over the Roman Empire for this festival that's taking place. So they are there, they're speaking in these different tongues, and then these people hear it. It says, now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. But when this sound occurred, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were astounded and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us can hear them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia, in Judea, in Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God in our own tongues. They were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? This is interesting, okay? Because this connects back to Genesis. What event in Genesis? The Tower of Babel. 
So you you have these humans in their own human effort trying to ascend to heaven. And that that, that, that hasn't changed. That still happens in our world today. People who think they're going to make a utopia without God, right? So there are still people who believe this. But at the Tower of Babel, God confused their languages, right? So they couldn't communicate with with each other, and they all spread around the earth, right? That's how we got all these nations with different languages. And this is sort of a, a, a bringing that back to say, okay, those in the Church of Christ from every nation around the earth are going to be one. They're going to be united. So it's kind of an undoing of the Tower of Babel incident. So they all said, what does this mean? We're hearing them in our own languages. How can this be possible? How are they, <laughs> how do they know all these languages? But, it, but, the, but then it also says, but some sneered and said, they're drunk on new wine. They're, they're, what they're saying with new wine, they're just saying, you're drunk on cheap wine. What we're saying today is like boxed wine, cheap wine, you know? So they're making fun of them, they're sneering. And I've encountered many people in my, in my life of evangelizing and witnessing people who sneer at the gospel message, you know? Oh, do you really believe that the, all the animals were on one ark? Oh, do you really believe that God spoke for this? Oh, do you really believe that? Like, yes, I do. But some people want to sneer. Some people want to sneer. So, Peter realizes, I need to uh, explain this situation. And actually the word here is, he he wants to give an apologia, an an apologetic for what just happened. So Peter stood up with the eleven, so the other eleven apostles, disciples of Jesus. He raised his voice and he proclaimed to them, Fellow Jews and all you residents of Jerusalem, Let this be known to you and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk. As you suppose, it's only nine in the morning. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. See, he's quoting Joel. And Joel is a very important book of the Bible to the end times. See, he's quoting an end times. So he says this, he quotes Joel, and it says, And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all people. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my servants in those days, both men and women, and they will prophesy. I will display wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Wow. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord. It says blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. Actually, the motto of the Salvation Army is blood and fire. The blood of Jesus Christ and the fire of the Holy Spirit. The blood of Jesus, fire of the Holy Spirit. I love that. So he continues, he says, Fellow Israelites, listen to these words. This Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, You used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. God raised him up, ending the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by death. For David says of him, why, this is interesting, why is Peter quoting the prophets in the Old Testament? Because he's in front of a bunch of Jews. They all know the Torah. They all know the Old Testament, right? They're going to listen much more closely if he's quoting and quoting from the OT, right? So he quotes David, who's who's more highly revered than David by, by the Jews, maybe Moses, but David, very highly regarded, he says this. For David says of him, I saw the Lord ever before me, 
Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Moreover, my flesh will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to Hades or allow your Holy One to see decay. You have revealed the paths of life to me. You will fill me with gladness in your presence. Brothers and sisters, I can confidently speak to you about the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn on oath to him to see one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. He was not abandoned in Hades, and his flesh did not experience decay. God has raised this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. So he's the thing. Us 11 disciples, us apostles, we saw this. We saw Jesus after he was crucified alive. They're eyewitnesses, is what he would say. We saw him alive, and we're telling you that he was alive. We saw it. We saw him alive several times after he had died, walking around, talking to us, eating, drinking. He was alive physically, not, not just a ghost, but physically resurrected. God has raised this Jesus, and we are all witnesses. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. So he's saying this is Jesus' work, that, that we're filled with the Holy Spirit and, and, and speaking in different languages. This is Jesus who did this. Jesus did this. I love that. It says, for it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I become your enemy's footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Wow. In one uh, tr translation, it says, you killed the Lord of life. You killed Jesus. That's not good. You need to repent. And it says, it says this. This is great. It says, when they heard this, <coughs> excuse me. When they heard this, this whole crowd was listening to Peter talk. They were pierced to the heart. Pierced to the heart. And, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do now? Have you ever had that moment in your life where you're like, what do I do now? What do I do now? I'm an alcoholic, what do I do now? I'm, I'm, I'm stuck on cigarettes, what do I do now? I'm struggling with lust, what do I do now? I'm struggling with whatever, you know? You're stuck in something. And the right thing is to be grieved, to be what you would say pierced in the heart, and to say, what should I do? And Peter replied, <clears throat> Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent and believe in Jesus. Change your heart and life, believe in Jesus. For the promise is for you, and for your children, and for all who are far off. That's us. That's us. All who are far off. That's us. 2,000 years later, in Owasso, Michigan. That's us. Wow. That's crazy. The promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. I've never preached a sermon where 3,000 people got saved. I can say that pretty sure. <clears throat> 3,000 people. The church starts there. Boom. And who did that? Did, did Peter do that? He was a willing vessel, but it was the Lord who did that. It was the Holy Spirit who did that, and the Holy Spirit always points us right back to Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
right? So it's all about Jesus. Jesus is doing this. You would call the book of Acts the Acts of Jesus Christ. Jesus did it, right? But a lot of times people will stop there. But I don't want to stop there. I'm going to go a little further. It says, continues in Acts chapter 2, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So they didn't just have one emotional moment where they got saved and then went right back to their old lives. They got into discipleship. They got into to, to churches, to Bible studies, and they got fed. It says... They, they listened to the apostles' teaching, to, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread together, and to prayer. It says everyone was filled with awe and many wonders, and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together, so they weren't over a Zoom meeting, they were together, and they held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. This is not socialism, by the way. This is freely giving of their own possessions, not being forced to give up what they have by a governmental authority. So people will point to this and say, ah, Jesus was a socialist. Wrong. This is just this is a lot like charity, you know? We, we, we can give to those in need. So... They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves. It says every day. Ooh, it doesn't say every week. It says every day. Why do we meet weekly then? Shouldn't we be meeting like every day? Whoa, uh oh. I'm a pastor. I should have seen this before. Maybe we should be meeting like seven days a week then. Whoa. Ooh, oh. Yeah, like we have our, day, our groups, right? We, it's almost like we're meeting every day almost. So they met together daily, ah, daily, devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple. So they met in the temple, that's good. But it also says they broke bread from house to house. So they're meeting one-on-one, -on -one, right? They're meeting outside the church. They're having fellowship outside the church. So we need to be doing that here too. We need to be hanging out outside the church. I want to challenge each of you over the next few weeks Invite someone in this room that you don't know that well out to coffee, out to lunch, out to get to know them better. That wouldn't be so bad, would it? So, they ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. So the Lord's just adding, adding, adding. Pretty soon lots of people are getting saved. And that's just the start. You can go all the way through the 28 books or 28 chapters in the book of Acts and just see all these incredible things that the Lord does through the early apostles. What you also see, though, is that there's always a counter to whatever they need to do. They push forward, they're pushed back again, they push forward, they're pushed back. That is Satan, the evil one, and his enemy, and his evil forces trying to stop the growth of the church. But the more they try, the more they fail. So praise the Lord. That is our word today.